Let's talk about A1C or HbA1c or hemoglobin A1c. It's all the same thing. One of my recent A1c tests made me and my endo smile a little bit. It came back at borderline prediabetes levels, 5.7%, which is, if we look at this normal A1c chart, there you can see it's the borderline A1c for prediabetes. So does this mean that I have prediabetes or that my diabetes is going away? No, unfortunately not. I live with type 1 diabetes and that 5.7% means that I'm managing my blood sugars very tightly. That normal A1C range is more for assessing whether or not our diabetes management is working or for diagnosis. Mine has fluctuated a bit over the last year and the last time I went to see my primary doctor it was 6.2% and now as you can see here from this at home test it's back to 5.7%. I'm happy with that. My goal is to keep my A1C below 6.5%, but honestly, I prefer it to be closer to 6%. But A1C goals, just like any other diabetes goals, should be personalized. So let's dig a bit deeper. I want this video to give you a good understanding of A1C, as well as how you achieve and maintain the A1C that you're hoping for. And that includes talking about A1C targets for people living with diabetes, as well as how do you actually translate that A1C number into average blood sugars. And we'll also get practical. More than half of this video, I've dedicated to talking about the five things that I do to keep my A1C exactly where I want it. Okay, so A1C, what is it? The A1C test is a blood test that tells you your average blood sugars over the last two to three months. The reason why it's two to three months is a little fascinating. So let's quickly geek out. An A1C test it measures the average amount of blood glucose that has attached itself to hemoglobin in the red blood cells over the last few months. Red blood cells only live for about three months before regenerating, and that is why we'll only see the results for the last two to three months. Fascinating, right? Another way of thinking about it is that your blood only remembers about three months back. So from one small blood sample, you'll be able to get your A1C measurement. And that's also why you don't need to be fasting for this test and it can be done at any time of the day, the blood sugar information is already stored. Most often A1C is measured every three to six months, but for some people it's more frequent and for some people it's less frequent. You can have it measured in your doctor's office. It's a simple blood draw either from your vein or a finger prick, or you can do it at home using an at-home test kit. If you go to your doctor's office and you get your A1C measured there, you're pretty sure that's accurate. I have also found that the at-home kits are really accurate. So I've done 12 tests so far, and there was only one that came back higher than my actual A1C. But what should our A1C be? Should we all be aiming for normal, non-diabetic A1Cs below 5.7%? No, it's not a one size fits all. Overall, if you live with diabetes and if you have no special considerations, the American Diabetes Association, so the ADA, recommends keeping your A1C below 7% to reduce the risk of diabetes complications. We should all work with our medical teams on establishing the optimal A1C targets for us. We're not all the same. Pretty much all the medical professionals I've ever talked to don't think there is one A1C level that we should all strive for. As mentioned, I aim to stay below 6.5%, prefer to be closer to six, but your target, the optimal A1C level for you right now, might be higher or lower. And your targets can and often should change over time. We need to adjust to where we are in life and what works for us at a given time. Before we talk about what changes we can make to lower or maintain our A1C levels, let's dig a level deeper and look at the blood sugar levels behind that A1C percentage. Because you can pretty easily convert your A1C into average blood sugar levels and the other way around. And I promise you, no math needed, we're gonna use an online calculator. I use this online calculator from the ADA. You can type in professional.diabetes.org forward slash glucose underscore calc. Whew, that's a long one. You can type that into your browser or just Google it. Here you have the calculator and you can choose to convert one way or the other. My A1C, which is 5.7%, and you can see that corresponds to an average blood sugar level of 117. Let's say I know my blood sugar is closer to 125 on average. I'll type that in and here you go, an A1C of 6%. I like looking at the numbers a little closer. I think it makes it easier to understand. 
and also highlights how you can fairly quickly see changes to your A1C. Because any change to your blood sugar average is going to result in a different A1C. Let's say you make a small change, like changing up a meal that wasn't working for you, that was making your blood sugars run high. And let's say that you only made this change a month ago, four weeks. Well, that could still impact your overall A1C. Let me just show you an example here using a little bit of easy numbers. So let's assume that the two first months, our average is 160 milligrams per deciliter. And then the third month, we make it small change, big change, is enough of a change that our average goes down to 150. Okay, so we add up those numbers, that's 470. We divide it by three, because it's three months, that takes us to an average of 157. If we then type that into the calculator, you can see that's an A1C of 7.1%. The average for 160, that's 7.2%. So we make changes for one month, and what do you know? Our A1C went down. So are you ready to make some changes? As promised, here are the five things that I do to keep my A1C where I want it. My blood sugars are always closer to where I want them when I'm not winging it. And using a logbook really helps with that. I write down my blood sugar levels, my medications, so most often my insulin, and my food. And that brings a level of focus that for me always results in tighter blood sugar levels. I think it forces me to pay attention and even more importantly, to what works and what doesn't work. The thing is, when we're winging it or just relying on memory, I think we're missing too much. Let me ask you this. Do you remember what you ate yesterday and how it impacted your blood sugars? One thing is the actual act of locking, but something that's really powerful is then to go over your numbers, look for patterns, and make meaningful changes when needed. And that leads me to the second thing that I do, and that is to make changes between doctor visits. And this does not have to be changes to your medication schedule. I think most people work closer with their medical team to make any adjustments to medications, and of course you should continue to do that. But it can be changes to your eating habits, to your exercise schedule, to your sleep patterns, or to any of the other things that can impact your blood sugars. I truly believe that taking responsibility between my doctor's appointments is what makes me successful in achieving my goals. Let's say that you, through locking, realize that your blood sugars always seem to be high after dinner. Well, what are you going to do to try and change that? Maybe going for a walk after dinner can correct that. Or changing the size of your meal, or maybe even what's in your meal. Or if you're disgusted with your medical team, changing an insulin dose for dinner might do the trick. There are a lot of things that we can do. And I actually think it's kind of empowering knowing it's not just up to our doctors. There's a lot of things that we can do on a day-to-day -day basis. And one of the things that I do daily is moving my body. And that's my third thing that helped me manage my blood sugars and my A1C. And in no way do you need to be as extreme as I am. I exercise most days and on days when I'm not at the gym, I try to get at least 60 minutes of walking in. Walking is probably one of the most accessible types of movement. And if the weather doesn't permit for you to walk outside, try walking at home in place you can even do that in front of the TV while you watch your favorite show. When you're walking, your body will pull glucose out of the bloodstream. And if you have an insulin production or if you injected insulin, you most likely will see your blood sugars come down. Walking is great. I really, really enjoy walking, but my true love is resistance training. Resistance training is great for pretty much everything, including improving your insulin sensitivity. What that means is that resistance training can improve how effective your body is at utilizing the insulin that you either produce or that you inject, which in turn can mean lower blood sugars. Resistance training is anything that puts your muscles under tension. That can be body weight exercises, you can use resistant brands, or you can use weights. The next thing I do is that I focus on my evening habits. I wanna make sure that I go to bed with healthy blood sugars and I want them to stay that way overnight. We sleep about a third of the time, so if you can keep your blood sugars in range overnight, you've made a huge leap towards reaching your A1C goals. My main three tips for getting a good night's sleep with stellar blood sugars are, I keep my dinner light and I try to be done by 7 p.m. Most nights I won't snack or I'll keep my snacking to a bare minimum. And if I have time, I'll go for an evening walk. I usually don't go to bed before midnight, so that gives me plenty of time to stabilize my blood sugars before bed. 
Also, if you eat close to bedtime, you might run into a few issues. When we sleep, our digestion is slowed down. So if you eat a large meal right before bed, you might risk that energy is being released into your bloodstream overnight. And that could mean elevated blood sugars for several hours. This doesn't mean that I'll never have a late dinner or that I'm never snacking. It just means that it's not an everyday thing. And finally, if you want to achieve the best A1C result for you, you have to experiment. You have to figure out what works best for you. Just as our A1C goals, they do not have to be the same and neither do our path to get there. We can go by guidelines and what works for others and we can try it on for size. And some will work and some won't work and some will work for a time and then we have to switch things up. Diabetes is not a static condition. Our bodies are not static. And I think the ones who see the best results are those who are willing to experiment and to learn and to adapt. And the new thing for me is that I started drinking apple cider vinegar in early November. It was part of an experiment for a YouTube video. And to my surprise, adding two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar in the evening before bed seems to improve my insulin sensitivity. I did not expect that. But as long as it seems to be working and I'm not seeing any side effects, I'll continue to drink that. So there are a lot of things that we can do to improve our A1C, but I would encourage you to not just focus on your A1C in isolation. We have to remember that it's an average of high and low blood sugars. And an average that's pulled down by too many low blood sugars is not healthy either. Check this out. This is an illustration of three sets of blood sugars and each blood drop is averaging 97. That would be an A1C of 5%. But the issue is that this last blood drop doesn't show a healthy way to a lower A1C. It has a lot of unhealthy lows pulling it down. If you wear a continuous glucose monitor, so a CGM, your doctor might be more focused on your time and range than on your A1C. Your time and range show you how much of the time your blood sugars are between 70 to 180. You can see my time and range here. It's 87%, which I'm cool with. And you can also see my average blood sugar of 117, which translates to an A1C of 5.7%. Many doctors will look at both time and range and A1C to get a good comprehensive view of their patient's blood sugar management. But if you do not have a CGM, obviously looking at time and range is not an option. So then your doctor has to rely on your A1C percentage as well as your finger sticks. Keeping your blood sugars as well as your A1C at the right level for you is super important. And we talked about five things that I do in this video and you can find even more tips on how to manage your blood sugars in this video. And while you check that out, why not subscribe to my channel and turn on notifications? That way you'll never miss a thing. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.